This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland and Sister Patricia Holland was given September 9th, 1986. The other day I read a story about a man and woman from a little town named Calhoun, Georgia. They are called the Deacon and Inez. These two established a home in Calhoun and began raising a family. What set them apart from others was that they also cleaned up a shed in which to house their winner's club. The winner's club got its beginning when Deacon agreed to start a cub, a cub scout den for some retarded children in the town. Deacon and Inez believed that God does not make mistakes, and they believed all of God's children's can be, children can be winners at something. Deacon and Inez spend their time searching for children to love. Their winner's club is a place of dreams where they light candles in the darkness of the mind. It is a place where many have overcome serious obstacles to reach their dreams. When Deacon and Inez are asked how they get along with these children, they answer quickly, don't ever tell a lie and help them find their dreams. The two people who will speak to us now are the resident keepers of dreams. They are in the habit of speaking plainly eternal truths. You who have been here before know that. We who work with them know that. If you listen carefully and respond to what they say, you will discover a more beautiful, more valuable dream than you've ever had before. These two are devoting their lives to help us all find our dreams, and they are inspired in their leadership. I am pleased to introduce Patricia T. Holland and President Jeffrey R. Holland, President and Sister Holland. We feel a little like the Marine recruit who ran to his sergeant and said he was surrounded, and the sergeant said, great, shoot in any direction. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very, very much for coming this morning. I'll have more to say about that in a minute, and as always, our thanks to this magnificent music department at the university, and this morning specifically the university singers. Now. Before we begin today, we have to get something straight. I am very sorry. I am very sorry, but I must put down what seems to be a very widespread rumor. This will be a personal blow to you. I know that. But unfortunately, former BYU President Dallin Oaks and I will not be presenting a live rock concert this month. Now we know how much you want us. And we know that no other university can claim a rock group out of its last two presidents. But I am very, very sorry. Holland Oaks cannot work it into their schedules <laughs> this fall. Now please, please don't be too disappointed. Now, if you think having a rock star for a president is strange, you ought to try to be married to one. <laughs> for those of you who may be new to BYU, we need to explain, as you can already tell from the clock, that in this particular assembly, we're always under severe time limitations. Most of what we need to say to you at the start of each year is sort of businesslike. And Sister Holland and I say now, already, this early, that we hope you will attend our first devotional next semester when things are a little more relaxed and we can be a little more parental. Speaking of parents, I am reminded that we had many parents of our new freshmen at our home last week, and they repeatedly spoke of entrusting you to our care. They want so much for you to be happy and safe, and we share that hope. We lie awake nights some evenings talking long into the night about you. We care about you so much. We love you as if you are our own sons and our own daughters, and we want you to have the most wonderful year. Let's begin this morning with a quote and then a story. President Reagan said recently in a public address, a nation's greatness 
is measured not just by its gross national product or military power, but by the strength of its devotion to the principles and values that bind its people and define their character. Now, let me repeat that this morning one more time to start a school year. I will take the liberty of inserting some university language. Brigham Young University's greatness is measured not just by its collective grade point average or its football success, but by the strength of its devotion to the principles and values that bind its people and define their character. Now, please just hold that in the old cerebral cortex for a minute, and we'll come back to it. Now the story. In the summer of 1973, Brother David K. Skidmore received military orders to report for duty in Thailand. Leaving a wife and two small children behind, David hoped to make the year pass as quickly as possible. On the evening of his arrival, he was invited to join in a social gathering with his new squadron. He turned down an alcoholic drink or a soda pop and tried to obscure himself in quiet conversation amid the pounding of the music and the layered haze of smoke. As he was introduced around, Brother Skidmore eventually ended up standing at the bar with the squadron commander, a colonel. With the officer's arm around David's neck, he was a captive, listening to tales of airplanes, daring, and past comrades. Soon a signal was given and the men gathered around the bar. The music was turned off and it became very, very quiet. Everyone was served a small drink of very strong alcohol. When the drinks came to Brother Skidmore, he said quietly, trying to be casual, no, thank you. I prefer this soft drink. The room went absolutely silent. But this is a squadron tradition, the man said. Thoughts raced through David's mind. Why me? Why in front of the whole squadron? Why this very first night? Trying to sound confident, David explained that he did not drink alcohol, but would participate with soda pop. With that, the silence deepened, and the commander's arm tightened around his neck, and he said, Lieutenant, I'm ordering you to have this drink. You'll drink it if I have to pour it down you myself. David thought of how far he could get if he tried to fight. He envisioned the results and an unpleasant visit to the wing commander to change squadrons. And again he asked himself, why me? But he gathered his courage amidst the waiting silence and said, I'm sorry, sir, I will not drink alcohol. Electricity filled the air, and David prayed silently with all of his heart. The colonel leaned back and measured him with his eyes and then replied, You are going to drink this. David kept praying, and then the colonel added, Unless you are a Mormon, what relief filled a soldier's sore soul? <laughs> of course he was a Mormon. He had always been a Mormon. Why hadn't he said so earlier? Yes, sir, I am a Mormon, he reassured. The commander quizzed David again to make sure he wasn't simply taking an easy out. And then he said, a soft drink for this man, please. Unless you are a Mormon. What should that little caveat mean as we begin another school year at BYU? What does it say, in President Reagan's language, of devotion to principles and values that bind us as a people and define our character? Someone once asked, if in a court of law you were accused of being a Latter-day Saint, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I leave that with you while I talk of contemporary problems. I saw a headline recently which caught my eye. It would have been hard not to catch an eye. It declared across the top of the page, moral rot in America. The writer's contention is that over the past 100 years, there has, quote, been a de decay in the values of American society from a moral code that was once one of the wonders of the world into what is now a black hole 
of moral relativism, close quote. Let me quote another newspaper. There's been an awful lot of talk about sin, crime, and plain old antisocial behavior this summer, drugs and pornography at home, terror and brutality abroad. Maybe it's just the heat, she says, or maybe these categories of conduct are really on the rise. What strikes me, the writer muses, is our curiously deficient, not to say defective, way of talking about them. We don't seem to have a word anymore for wrong, not in the moral sense, as in, for example, theft is wrong. Now let me qualify quickly, she adds. There's no shortage of people condemning each other. Name-calling is still very much in vogue. But where the concept of wrong is really important as a guide to one's behavior or that of determining one's side in a moral issue, that is missing. As a guide and a standard to live by, Mrs. Greenfield concludes, you don't hear much these days about right and wrong. The very notion is, I suppose, considered personally embarrassing since it has such a repressive Neanderthal ring to it." Close quote. Well, life is much better than that at BYU because we expect it to be better, and we work very hard at making it better. But Somerset Mom once reminded, every good and excellent thing in this life stands moment to moment on the razor's edge of destruction. And if it is to be preserved, it must be defended every hour of your life. Now, we want for you a good and excellent life at BYU. We are determined to preserve and defend it. We intend not to be deficient or defective in speaking here of right and wrong. We speak like Brother Skidmore, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or as non-member guests of that church. In that spirit, we're especially pleased to acknowledge on the stand today the presidents of our 15 BYU stakes. They join us in welcoming you back to school. They and their vast stake and ward associates help us make this a special place. We honor them in their calling and publicly pay tribute to them today. We hope that they can join us on the stand for these experiences every time we hold them in the future. We're closely linked with them in the work of strengthening devotion to principles and values that bind us as a people and define our character. Now let us just touch on a few reminders as we emphasize what it means to be a Latter-day Saint at BYU in a new school year. Please understand that with the limit on our enrollment, there has been increased academic competition for admission to BYU. Concurrent with that, and of equal force with it, must always be increased emphasis on worthiness and faith for those who would enjoy the privileges here. Such effort on your part will guarantee that BYU's greatness will always be more than grade point averages and football success, pleasant as those are. There is a war declared on drugs and substance abuse in this country, a war we have always fought at BYU and which must be continued. The tragic deaths of gifted young athletes like Len Bias and Don Rogers get our attention because they strike the young or the rich or the famous. But far beyond sports figures and rock musicians, there is an epidemic of abuse, a Niagara of narcotics taking from us as a nation our ability to control our destiny and guarantee our power. This is a national crisis. And drugs will not be tolerated on this campus. Not users, not pushers, not providers, not even experimenters. The devastation of lives elsewhere is all the explanation anyone needs for our hardline position here. We include in that ban alcohol, still the most widely abused and deadly drug, at least in terms of fatal accidents, in the nation. We take this stand firmly, like Brother Skidmore, because we're Mormon. There are other standards that we must keep if BYU's greatness is to be genuine and long-lasting. Please be honest. Don't take what is not yours, including answers on another's exam or a plagiarized essay or computer software now electronically pilfered in an instant. Be honest, especially with yourself. There is too little discipline in most of our housing units, on campus and off. I'm asking every landlord and every bishop, even now as I ask every roommate, 
to accept responsibility for the living circumstances and moral climate of our BYU community. Be clean. Don't pet and play and then wonder why there are problems. There is too much sexual transgression in this world, in this church, and on this campus. Explicitly sexual material should not be your entertainment at movie theaters or on TV. We cannot monitor your cable network and will not try. We cannot do that any more than we can monitor the videos you can rent at at least three dozen locations within a mile of this building. We are simply stating what you already know to be a standard for Latter-day Saints. We are asking for a most unusual community, one that is bound by devotion to principles and values that define our character. We're asking you to stand up and be counted because you're Mormon. Dress and grooming standards certainly do not need to preoccupy our time and our conversation. These are simple and clearly stated principles. They can be understood by everyone. Be neat, be clean, be modest. That's really all we need to say. Shorts are not acceptable wear on this campus for men or women, and they never have been. Neither are short skirts or grubby jeans. Almost all of you look absolutely terrific, marvelous all the time. Thank you for that. You look that way to me this morning. To those very few exceptions, and there are only a very few, we simply say that extreme attire or shabby grooming are not acceptable here. Just be the best you can in every way, including your personal appearance. Let that be an outward sign of an inward grace. Look and be and speak as educated, civilized men and women. That's part of what it means to be at BYU. Do it, because you're a Mormon. May I caution the women in the audience not to be so socially conscious or so consumed with dating that you forget what a Latter-day Saint woman stands for and why she is so strongly encouraged to get an education. Marriage is the highest and the holiest union we know in mortality. I hope it comes to every one of you at the proper time. But there is too much in our world, including in those videos my husband spoke of, which screams only of sex appeal and beautiful body, and almost no voice anywhere asking for faith and intelligence and clean, strong women. The world is generally encouraging exactly what the Proverbs call a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. That is, a fair woman without discretion. Let me encourage you to use discretion. Use good judgment. Don't think that your future or your fortune hinges on your face or your figure. Develop all of yourself. If you'll be personable and intelligent, and above all, if you will be spiritual, so will the men. Be what the Lord has designed women to be, and we will have that celestial community we have been speaking of. We need these kinds of opportunities, this very setting this morning, to be together as such a community, to speak to each other and to remind ourselves of the special nature of our opportunity here. For that reason, we are putting new and greatly increased emphasis on our university assemblies this year. Thank you so very much for your attendance this morning. And may I thank specifically the faculty who have been so responsive and who have the keys to communication with you here, who have attended with you and encouraged your participation this morning. With the approval and blessing of our Board of Trustees, we have carefully revised and quite seriously limited the annual forum devotional and 15-stake fireside calendar. This has been done to accommodate even the busiest of students and faculty members and staff. We will advertise these events well, and for the weekday assemblies, we will shorten the preceding class, delay the start of the next class, all in an attempt to let you come and go from the Marriott Center to even the most distant buildings on campus. We're asking the faculty there to assist by announcing the speaker and coming with you to these assemblies. We commend them for that. We will be closing all but the most essential services on campus for the hour so that as many as possible may take advantage of this special association. One young man this morning said he would be able to attend a devotional for the first time in three years because he has always had to work at this hour. I don't want us to be 26,000 splendid strangers. A few times each semester, we need to be together as family and friends to strengthen our values and bind us as a people. 
As President Balaf has announced, our speaker next week will be President Ezra Taft Benson. He is the prophet and president of our church and the chairman of the BYU Board of Trustees. Nowhere else in the world, in no other college, will you have such an experience. Surely everyone in the BYU community will want to be in attendance to hear President Benson's message. Please, please let me encourage you to plan to attend each carefully calendared assembly this year. The administration has never worked harder to provide such outstanding and marvelous speakers. May I simply note that with the help of the First Presidency and our communication with them about this, through the course of this year, 15 stake firesides and devotionals, we will have every member of the First Presidency participate and virtually every member of the Quorum of the Twelve. May I make a special appeal this morning regarding your study habits? And then Pat will comment on one very important part of that task. As any glance at our physical plan or faculty strength or course offering will quickly attest, an absolutely astronomical investment has been made in your education. You're receiving at BYU what a recent national publication described quite simply as the educational buy of the nation. The thousands of dollars of difference intuition between other private universities and our own comes as a direct benefit to you from hundreds of thousands, millions technically, of silent benefactors, the faithful tithe, tithe payers of this church. These are the offerings of the faithful around the globe, many of whom may never have seen BYU nor ever have a child or grandchild attend here. And yet the leaders of the church care enough about you who can come to make this stunning investment in a handful. In addition to all the buildings and the ball games and the surrounding amenities here, every one of us, every single one of us, receives the equivalent of several thousand dollars in personal scholarship money each year just for attending. And that is in addition to whatever other financial aid you may also receive from the school. That is given you because the brethren love you and believe in you. They believe you will learn and grow and bless the church and mankind because of your unique experience here. They believe you will stand proudly and tall when someone asks if you're a Mormon. Please take full advantage of this opportunity. It will be gone too quickly. I love fun and frisbees and fall afternoons too. But don't let them blunt your primary purpose in coming here. Pursuit of a superb education preparing you for service to God and fellow man. Time matters so very much to me now. I need it so much and I seem to have so little for the truly important tasks I wish to pursue. Maybe I'm just getting old. In any case, I feel, and you will soon enough, the pain of Yeats' lines, the years like great black oxen tread the world, and I am broken by their passing feet. Grab that ring as it passes and then let extra effort shape your special destiny. Study first, study well, study hard. Then play or party or pig out. <laughs> Make time work for you, not against you. Start your papers early. Someone once said that there is no such thing as good writing. There is just good rewriting. Your essays cannot be of the quality we expect, nor can you be taking advantage of your education in the way we are pleading if you leave papers until the night before they're due and then rush toward a deadline with literary meat cleaver in hand. Furthermore, your roommates are not benefited by primal screams at 2 a.m. <laughs> when the word processor goes on the fritz. Write early, let it cool. Sleep on it, come back for refinement. Polish your prose, take pride in saying something. That takes time. Use it or lose it. Study first and play later. Leonardo da Vinci's cry still holds, O oh God, Thou dost sell us all good things at the price of labor. Make this year count. In that same spirit, my, may I just insert a very personal piece of counsel on a matter that has been a great blessing to us and I believe can be the greatest blessing to you. While working on his Ph.D. at Yale University, <clears throat> my husband got to know well one of the senior reference librarians who had given him valuable help researching for his dissertation. On a whim one day, he said, Eileen, I need to know how many books we have in either the Sterling Memorial or the Beinecke Rare Book Libraries, 
which claimed to have been delivered by an angel. Now, the librarian gave my husband a peculiar look, but, but my husband has always received peculiar looks. And he said, and she said, I don't know of any books that have been delivered by angels. Swords, maybe, or chariots, but I certainly don't know of any books. Well, just run a quick check for me, would you? It may take a little doing, but I really would like to know. It would help me with some religious writing I am doing. Now, please understand that Yale has the fourth largest library in the nation, with nearly nine million volumes in its collection. Eileen dutifully did some checking. For several days, she had nothing to report, but then one day she was all smiles as my husband strolled by to his carol. Mr. Holland, you who, she said, very unlibrarian like. <laughs> I have a book for you. I found one book which has been claimed to have been delivered by an angel. And this is the book she showed him. But it is one from your people, she said. She always spoke of Latter day Saints as my husband's people, which probably meant she had confused him with Wilford Woodruff. But it's one from your people, she said, and she held up this paperback copy of the Book of Mormon. I'm told you can buy this for a dollar. My word, she said, an angel's book for a dollar? You'd think angels would charge more. <laughs> but then again, she said, where would they spend it? <laughs> well, that's a funny story, and it's a true story. Any of you who know my husband knows that's a true story. But I wonder if we have considered the majesty of our message to the world. Prophets are not just everyday people, and angels do not visit us very often. But of all the books, the many, many books that will be at your disposal this year at the university, there is only one book that has been delivered by an angel. President Benson has asked the church as a whole to renew the reading of this book and re-repeat that invitation to you, our BYU family. At a very difficult and challenging time in my life, Jeff gave me a copy of the scriptures, and I began to read the Book of Mormon as I have never read it before. In a very real way that I cannot share with you today, but which is very personal and very true, it saved my life. I treasured every word in that book, and I savored every chapter I came to know the promise of the section of section 84 in the Doctrine and Covenants, that my mind was not darkened and I was not under condemnation because I had not forgotten the Book of Mormon. We ask you, every one of you, every day you are here, to read at least one verse in the Book of Mormon, and more of you can, but something from the Book of Mormon to give light to your life, the light of the Spirit even the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And I promise you, if you do this, you will see miracles happen. May we close with one final story. It is a BYU variation on Brother Skidmore's experience. For more than 25 years, Ben E. Lewis was executive vice president of Brigham Young University. He's now retired. I recently asked him to do something very important for the university, for which I wanted to give him a token of modest compensation. He refused the money. I argued with him and told him I was the president and he had to do what I said. He said he was retired and that he didn't have to do anything, I said. <clears throat> I shoved the money at him and he shoved it back. We argued some more and then he told me this story. He said that following his undergraduate years at BYU, where he was a student body president, by the way, he had received an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship for graduate work at the University of Denver. As part of the Sloan Fellowship, he and a handful of other students were regularly taken out into the Colorado business community to meet those leaders and executives and enjoy rather high-level exchange with them. One particular professor always took the group and they spent many hours together. After each day's work with these business leaders, the professor would always stop somewhere for a beer with the students. Brother Lewis always ordered a soft drink. That led to a lot of conversation over many weeks, and the professor came to introduce Ben everywhere they went, at every business, every school, with every leader, with every executive. He introduced him this way. This is Ben Lewis. He's a Mormon, and he doesn't drink beer. 
Everywhere and with everyone, it was always the same, whatever the setting. This is Ben Lewis. He's a Mormon, and he doesn't drink beer. Over the course of months, that phrase was repeated probably more than a hundred times. This is Ben Lewis. He's a Mormon, and he doesn't drink beer. One day after a field trip to Fort Collins, the professor wheeled the group up to a pit stop of some kind, where, of course, he and the others ordered their beer. Except this time, the professor ordered two beers. Ben asked him why. He said, because it's my birthday, and you're going to have a beer with me. No, Brother Lewis said, I can't have a beer with you, but I do wish you a happy birthday. You will have a beer with me, the teacher said firmly. At least you will have one sip. It is very important to me, and I ask it of you this one time. And he put a dollar bill on the table. Drink one sip of the beer, and that dollar is yours. Brother Lewis said he didn't want to give offense, but no, he would, be able, he would not be able to drink the beer even for the dollar. That conversation with some increasing tension escalated until the man had placed $50 on the counter. He was obviously intent on having Brother Lewis participate in his birthday party. And he was in a position to do a student considerable academic harm if he were so inclined. Like Brother Skidmore, Brother Lewis wondered what to do. He did not want to offend a man who had been particularly kind to him. It was now a very awkward situation, and virtually everyone in the restaurant was aware of some difficulty over in that corner table. One sip would soothe the situation. Surely the Lord would know the integrity of his heart in this matter. Certainly no permanent damage could be done. Furthermore, $50 in 1941 meant a lot to a working student who didn't know where his next meal was coming from. There, a long way from home, as he mulled over this difficult situation and wondered how to handle that problem, words so clear and loudly spoken, so directly to his brain that they nearly startled him from the table, came. As audibly as I speak to you, Brother Lewis said he heard these words from an unseen source. This is Ben Lewis. He's a Mormon, and he drinks beer. Then he said, with some emotion in my office, I didn't drink the beer, and I can't take the money. I'm a Mormon. This is Brigham Young University. I love it with all my heart. I've given my life to it. I want to give more. I won't take the money. May we just say it again one more time. A person's greatness is measured not by her personal will or his professional standing but by the strength of his devotion to principle, by the values that define her character. God bless you to have a beautiful and rewarding new school year. Make it that way because you're Mormon. We love you and care very, very much about every one of you, including and especially those who may not be members of our church. We know of the jobs you're taking and the sacrifice you're making to stay in school. We see you come and go on campus with devotion and faith and hope for the future. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here this morning. We know some of your problems. We have shared some of your heartaches. You try so hard to be what you should be. We know that. We will forever love and admire you for it. You are good. You are good, and we will do our best at this university to also make you wise. We love you, and we measure that love as we measure the greatness of this school by the profundity and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sister Holland and I testify together of the Savior's life and mission and restored church in these latter days. We testify of the prophet Joseph Smith and the prophet Ezra Taft Benson, prophets, seers, and revelators in the grand tradition of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Alma. We testify this morning of God's love for you, and we certainly testify of our own. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Jeffrey R. Holland and Sister Patricia Holland was given September 9, 1986.